So we have uh, also Dr. Flynn and uh, Dr. Shadad Puri from our leadership team joining us and Dr. Ivy. Uh, so with this, I think we'll go live and start bringing people into the meeting. So Alyssa, uh, perhaps you wanna say something about the CME at the beginning here and then we'll launch into the meeting. Uh, sounds good. So we are live now, and uh, oh, okay. Alyssa from the University of Southern California handles our our continuing medical education, and she's just going to coach you a little bit about how to receive your continuing medical education. Thanks, Hattie. So, so I just got to, um, I will put in the chat to everyone um, the link for collecting CME. So we have recently changed to a new method of administering your CME certificates. Um, so there's more information on that in the in the link that you'll click to submit your information. Um, so you should be able to get your CME certificates now within um, you know a week or two of the meeting. So I will put that in the chat right now. And if you have any questions, just let me know. And two hours today for CME. Next next slide, please, Jenny. Most of you know me, and I am honored to be the fearless leader of this group to introduce you all to each other, to share best practices. And uh, it's amazing that, that this week we won an award at the federal level uh, for this work to spread best practices for cardiovascular disease, uh, stroke and diabetes. Today's program is dedicated to heart failure. Next slide, please. Our co-founder, Warren Barnes, the chief lawyer for the state of California in the healthcare area for decades, uh, came up with our motto for this project, the Right Care Initiative, and that is that we compete against disease and not each other. This is a, a wonderful collaborative that he helped me build with many long hours of devotion. Uh, next slide, please. I want to welcome you to our 293rd gathering of the Right Care Initiative today. And I want to dedicate this meeting to our veterans. This is Veterans Week. And thank both our veterans who fought for our country, knowing that freedom is not free, and to those who serve them, the healthcare providers at the VA and at our military hospitals. Um, are just such a blessing to this population, so devoted. And um, I want to say that if we're able to meet these goals of 80% of our patients at goal for blood pressure, cholesterol, and blood sugar, um, we will drive down not only uh, heart failure, but also heart attacks strokes and diabetic complications. And this is what we've been dedicating ourselves to for more than a dozen years through the University of Best Practices, which is now virtual. And um, next slide, please. So today we are blessed to have three amazing presenters. Our chairman, Bill Bomber, who many of you know from UC Davis, who's going to uh, not only talk about the evolution of heart failure treatment, but also um, he's going to add a bit on where we are with COVID. And just let's all thank the uh, biopharmaceutical industry for their amazing uh, dedication to saving us from this pandemic. Um, so we're going to hear more about a breakthrough in that area shortly. Um, we'll also hear from one of the leaders at Kaiser uh, in heart failure and also one of the leaders um, in at the Veterans Administration uh, about this topic. Dr. Bomber will be introducing them at length later. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the model, the synthesis of the best practices that we share. This is on our website. And these interventions um, are thought to be um, 
able to get us to 80% fewer heart attacks and strokes um, and diabetic complications. So I would commend you to look at our website and review it, digest it, and think about what you can adopt from this model that we have continued to evolve over a dozen years. Next slide, please. And with that, I'd like to introduce our fearless chairman, Dr. Bill Bomber, uh, who um, many of you know, he's trained so many other cardiologists around the state and nation. Uh, Dr. Bomber from UC Davis is also the past president of the California chapter of the American College of Cardiology and works on quality improvement for the state of California. And with that, I'm going to uh, hand the meeting over to Dr. Bomber to um, uh, lead. Thank you very much, uh, Hattie. Uh, I just would like to request that you allow me to screen share since uh, it's got, I'm prohibited while the other participant is sharing. So if we could just flip screen share over to me, that would be helpful. I'm sure Jenny is working on that. And uh, meanwhile, yeah, think, welcome to our, our leadership. Uh, we have, um, we have, people joining us from all over the country and all over the state of California. Um, so thank you all for being with us. And with that, Dr. Bomber, thanks for your update on COVID and on the evolution of heart failure treatment. Great. Now, can you see my COVID slide right now? Yes. Yes. Oh, good, good. All right. <laughs> uh, well, we have a great, a very exciting program today, and we planned on doing it on heart failure because we think it's uh, perhaps undertreated or underrecognized, especially in uh, California. And we've got a great program for that. But uh, of course, the best laid plans get uh, bumped every once in a while, and uh, along comes Delta virus or variant. And um, it continues to be a problem. And we're gonna give a few minutes uh, on that before we go into our very exciting uh, program on heart failure. So <clears throat> COVID-19 we've been dealing with for the last uh, almost two years uh, at this point in time. And uh, where are we today? US cases are shown on the upper left. And you can see that we're, we've gone through our fourth wave, <clears throat> but it's starting to even out. It's no longer coming down. So we're probably expecting for US cases, another bump uh, during the Thanksgiving to New Year's uh, holiday as people go inside. So it's not gone away as we would like. And there's probably going to be another smaller wave uh, that we see at this time. Uh, the deaths are in the next one in gray and show that we continue to have a thousand deaths uh, a day from, uh, uh, from uh, COVID on average. So it's still a problem in the US with it. And if we look at the last curve at the bottom right, this shows the world cases. If you look at that curve, what you see is a gradual increase from uh, February of uh, uh, 2020. And it continues to go up and down depending on variants and seasons, but it's sort of gradually going up globally. So this pandemic is not over. And there's good uh, evidence at this time that this pandemic will probably gradually fade into an endemic. And it's unlikely that we will eliminate COVID from the world uh, and from our population. And our early dream of uh, actually getting herd immunity is uh, maybe a little bit of a pipe dream. It will probably, this virus will be with us uh, for years to come, if not indefinitely. And we have to figure out how to deal with it. So <laughs> the good news is we've made progress. And here's the progress we've made in the last year. This was a slide I showed over a year and a half ago where we quite quickly figured out the life cycle of uh, COVID-19 uh, as it enters the cell, hacks into our system, and then uses our cells to manufacture or replicate itself. 
We identified seven steps that were pivotal to the virus replicating it, showing in the center, those seven steps we thought were, were susceptible for us to attack uh, the replication of this virus. And what we can show on the right are the successful ways we've come up with in the last year and a half to attack this virus. <clears throat> the monoclonal antibodies block the uh, insertion of the virus into the cells. We put in fake nucleosides. Uh, so the virus tries to replicate itself with <clears throat> uh, nucleosides that are uh, uh, erroneous and create mutations. And the Merck uh, trial that came out uh, produces fatal mutagenesis in the virus. And so it can reduce severe events and death by 50%. Uh, early on in the first case we had, February of 2020, we used remdesivir and got some benefit. And there is continued evidence in selected cases that the nucleotide analog <laughs> leads to chain termination of the virus and can get uh, earlier uh, uh, benefit for those infected with the disease. And the next one, uh, which is uh, shown as a number, is a combination in, uh, inhibitor, uh, PF0732, et cetera, with ritonavir. These are both protease inhibitors that have been introduced recently. The data came out last week showing that they could reduce severe infections by 89% and death by 100% in the acute treatment of the disease. Very positive results. And this is now submitted to the FDA for approval. And lastly, early on, we showed dexamethasone in the hyperinflammatory stage of cytokine storm could be beneficial in those individuals. So here we have one, two, three, four, five, uh, therapies that we've been able to come up with and show positive results in the last year and a half. Certainly good news uh, for those individuals. And we're still working on other ways to interfere with this virus as it tries to enter the cell and replicate. These are some of the pathways that are shown for the interference of the replication. And on the bottom, we show that we're looking at continual ways of blocking the entry of the virus into the cell. If we can keep it out of our cells, it's not going to be able to replicate. Once in the cells, we're looking at blockade of replication shown on the bottom. And we have at least two ways of doing that now that are successful. We're looking at a host of other ways of blocking the replication. The next on the bottom shows we're looking at ways of improving or boosting the innate immune response. And there are a number of trials ongoing for that, as well as enhancing the over, overall antiviral innate immunity of our bodies to fight this off. So in conjunction with our own bodies and these pharmaceutical drugs, we're looking at a variety of ways of stopping or blocking this virus before it spreads. In this slide I showed, uh, I believe a year and a half ago, which showed uh, early trials at that point in time that are shown in green and in yellow that were being investigated back in March of uh, 2020. Not all of those were successful and the green ones that don't have a red box did not pan out in those trials. But the, bot, but the yellow <laughs> and blue ones that have a red a uh, circle or uh, 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 around them or a red uh, box are ones that have been shown to be successful. So starting on the top, corti corticosteroids uh, has been shown to be effective. Remdesivir, an antiviral, was effective in trials. The standard of care in the middle was shown. We changed the standard of care for this and used pronine and other things which were quite new to our ICU treatment in that. And those significantly improved patients surviving their hospitalization. <clears throat> and then on the bottom, we show that direct oral uh, acting antiviral agents, which were initially IV or injection and are now uh, offered as an oral uh, option, uh, have been shown to be effective, including the most recent one with the uh, 89% uh, severe infection 
and 100% death prevention uh, treatment for that. On the right, you can see that early on, we showed uh, monoclonal antibodies and a cocktail of those could be effective. It was used in some of the highest uh, legislators or <laughs> executives in the US at one point and has uh, shown benefit that requires a injection. But the bottom one uh, on the right, which is vaccination, is probably the one that is going to be most useful for us because preventing access to this virus is very important. The vaccines have tried to prevent the spike from entering the cell. And those vaccines uh, were available in adults and adolescents. And as of last week, now children five to 11 uh, will be able to and are receiving that vaccine. So we get a large percent of the population with vaccination. And we expect that the uh, anywhere from six months to uh, <clears throat> four-year-olds will be able to get vaccinated probably in January of 2022 for that. So where are we today? Well, <clears throat> we have vaccinations, we have masks. Uh, where are we? Well, we still have a problem because of, uh, <clears throat> the virus continues to be effective. The Delta virus is very effective. So because this disease is not going to go away, is going to be endemic, it's going to be seen throughout the world and in parts of the US at high levels. And we have something called breakthrough infections, which even vaccinated people can get. Um, we're going to have to combine vaccination with other prevention modalities. So if we look at vaccination, the early trials <clears throat> with the mRNA showed 95% efficacy to prevent death and severe hospitalization, very good. But we now know that six months out from your vaccination, that immunity or that protection drops to 71 to 81%, depending on which vaccine you received at that time. So 20, up to 20% of people are still susceptible to a severe infection with COVID, even though you've been vaccinated. So we do recommend that when you travel out of the protection of your home or isolated family group, that you consider masking and masking single mask at 80% and double mask at up to 95% is still effective against this respiratory virus. So it has been effective in the past, it continues to be effective. And when you travel, the recommendation is masking in all cases and staying outside, which reduces the chance of getting the infection uh, by that and keeping your six foot distance and participating in activities only with fully vaccinated individuals where your incidence of exposure is much less at that time. So when you travel, take into account on the right, the region you're going to. So some regions of the US and certainly some countries have a much higher, up to a five-fold increased rate or prevalence of infections, be it breakthrough infections or be it unvaccinated infections in those individuals. Hang out with vaccinated people because their prevalence of breakthrough infections at 0.4 is three times less than it is among unvaccinated people at 1.5%. And if you look at this prevalence in the UK of 1.5% prevalence of the virus in unvaccinated people, that means over one in a hundred people you're going to meet in the UK at that time is going to have or carry that virus and could uh, communicate it to you. So regional case rate is extremely important. The other is at the bottom Z2 is the variant rate. And right now it looks like 99% of all COVID in the US is Delta. Delta is eight times more effective than the old alpha brand uh, for that virus. And it looks like it's driving out many of the other mutants to be 99% the case uh, for that. So we'll be living with Delta for a period of time and possibly years at that time. Now, if you get vaccinated and if you follow masking, 
and you have some social distancing and you avoid areas of high prevalence of the disease, you can significantly reduce your chance of having hospitalization from COVID and death. You cannot eliminate it because of breakthrough infections, even in vaccinated people. That's the reason we're recommending booster shots at this time because vaccination does wane at six months, uh, drops about 20% in efficacy in those cases for even death and severe infections. So you wanna go ahead and uh, participate in boosters when it is offered for you and hopefully get all of our kids who are available for the vaccine to get vaccination as well. So that was just a quick uh, thumbprint on, uh, <clears throat> on uh, the actual um, COVID. I'm gonna quickly go over a couple slides introduction on our top of, topic of today, which is heart failure uh, guidelines and pathways. And we're gonna look at things <clears throat> when we talk about guidelines, they include European guidelines, they include published this year, the Canadian guidelines shown on the right, as well as the US update to the consensus on heart failure shown on the left of ACC and AHA. But before we get to that, one minute to show you that heart failure is part of our overall plan for a master plan for California, which looks at what we're proposing as the A, B, C, D, E, F, Gs for California. And each of those letters stands for something. A is for assessment and anti-inflammatory and platelet agents on the top. B is for blood pressure treatment and medication. C is for cholesterol, which we have uh, sponsored and endorsed uh, through uh, Right Care. D is control of diabetes and diet. And E is for exercise, and that gets down to the letter F. And F stands for heart failure, which is a significant problem of cardiovascular prevention in the state of California, and includes the F in our A, B, C, D, E, and F. So today we're gonna focus just on the heart failure of that aspect. We're gonna talk about reduced mid-range and preserved heart failure, when we talk about reduced, what is it? It's the ejection fraction, the amount of blood that your heart squeezes out on each beat. Normally you squeeze out about 65% of the blood. When it's reduced, it's called reduced ejection fraction. Those candidates with heart failure are shown on the left. It's a large boggy heart shown on the left, more often seen in men who smoke and have myocardial infarction. Whereas preserved ejection fraction, where the ventricle actually squeezes out a normal but smaller amount of blood is shown on the right. That is prevalent in individuals, more often in females, those with hypertension, obesity, high cholesterol, and diabetes. Now we have, those are different types of heart failure and we have different recommended therapies for each of those. The risk factors we talked about the medications we're gonna talk about today are shown at the next lower level for reduced ejection fraction. We use the Vabradine, ACE, ARB, Arni, uh, aldosterone antagonists, and beta blockers were standard therapy. We've recently added SGLT2s, which you'll hear more about this afternoon uh, for that therapy for reduced ejection fraction. To the right, which is preserved ejection fraction heart failure. We didn't have a lot available uh, over the last 10 years, but recently there are some sub studies that suggest that aldosterone in inhibitors, as well as the potential of ARNI for some classes of these preserved ejection fraction, is possible. And we also have new evidence you'll hear today that SGLT2s may be very effective in the therapy for reducing hospitalization and death in patients with preserved ejection fraction. And you'll hear about that new and exciting information uh, with the next speaker. Um, as we go through the guidelines, I'm not gonna go through all of these. This is for reduced ejection fraction. But on the top, I just wanted to show you for each of these therapies that I've talked about, that is ARNI at the top, ACE, ARB, beta blockers, diuretics, <clears throat> aldosterone antagonists, and SGLT2 inhibitors. 
We have pathways to follow in the guidelines for titrating the dose, what can, which patients are candidate, and arranging the therapy as the patient progresses through it. Each of these therapies may require a titration up or a interaction, and they may not all be appropriate for every heart failure patient. So we have to pick and choose. These are the additional two therapies for reduced ejection fraction, where we use dilators like hydralazine and nitrates, especially in an African-American population. And we also have evaporating to slow heart rates when beta blockers are not enough. So we have a variety of drugs for reduced ejection fraction heart failure. As I mentioned earlier, there's fewer drugs proven for preserved ejection fraction or normal squeezing heart. And those are shown here, a little bit of evidence in subgroups that aldosterone antagonists and ARNIs could be effective in this population. But the more recent data that we'll talk about today is how SGLT2 inhibitors may in fact be beneficial for that. And these are based on recent trials that have just come out since August of this year in individuals. And you'll hear about those results with our next speaker today. Now that's about heart failure uh, medicines, which we'll be going into in a minute. Uh, it's also important to realize for those primary care physicians taking care of patients who may have or do have heart failure, when do they need to trigger to refer them to a specialist in heart failure or a program? And the six uh, indications are shown here. I'll highlight two of them. Uh, individuals who first come in with heart failure and we don't know what's causing it, uh, it's reasonable to have a specialist try to determine the cause of it because some of these causes are correctable. The other is patients with heart failure, chronic heart failure already diagnosed who have high risk features or symptoms where they're not getting better or they're getting worse. And as they persistently get worse, <clears throat> a lot of times a specialist can help with that. And the primary care physician may say, I want to refer at this time because in advanced heart failure, the therapy, including medicine, gets quite complex and you need to have a lot of time to, in fact, adjust and manipulate those individuals for that. So referral to the appropriate specialist is indicated. The last thing that I'll talk about is team-based approach, <clears throat> and that will be covered by our last speaker, where we're going to look at, it's not important just to have medicines available and, not to, and important not just to have a specialist, but you need a team base for these complex patients. And that team base has to use electronic health records to communicate all the data to all of the team at that time. Use patient monitoring devices. Many of these are homebound individuals. So you're using home implementation of scales, devices, uh, and uh, monitors for these individuals because you need to have daily monitoring of these patients to optimize their care. It also may include wearable activity monitors and smart phones can be very helpful in this population for tracking all of these areas for that. So it's extremely important to have a team-based approach which needs infrastructure as we speak for that. Now, how important is a comprehensive therapy? Well, standard therapy is fair in patients with heart failure. <clears throat> but if we look at the slides or the graphs on the right, the blue lines are those with optimal comprehensive treatment. And you can see that optimal comprehensive treatment for heart failure improves the survival up to 18 years in these individuals and improves their event-free survival by up to 15 years in these individuals. So standard therapy is fine, but you get an additional eight years of survival and six, years, uh, six to eight years of survival if you're on optimal comprehensive treatment. So that's why we're talking today about comprehensive treatment and improved survival in a pretty devastating disease, a disease where you could have a 50% five-year mortality, as bad as any other disease that we can talk about. 
So to improve it and offer an additional 18 years survival in these individuals is pretty good if we follow comprehensive care. So we should all be optimizing medical therapy and heart failure and doing a great job. And as Hattie mentioned earlier, Right Care looks at 80% compliance for our baseline for things like diabetes, blood pressure control, and cholesterol. Are we doing that good a job in heart failure? Are we at 80%? Well, these slides show in a heart failure population that we're nowhere close to 80% compliance in those individuals. In fact, at the admission baseline in this trial, in the CHAMP trial of heart failure individuals, you can see that optimal therapy at targeted doses was achieved in anywhere from two to 25% of individuals, not 80%, two to 25% at baseline. Well, maybe it takes time to titrate up. It takes a couple of weeks to get them on optimal beta blockers and maybe even Arnie and some other therapies. So after a year, we would expect better performance. Well, the slide, uh, the graphs on the right show at 12 months. And how are we doing? A slight improvement. Yeah, we went from two to 25% all the way up to three to 27% compliance after a year in a registry of heart failure individuals. And we have no idea what our compliance for SGLT2s is at this time. So this is the problem we face in heart failure today. We're nowhere near administering the appropriate amount of optimal care to these heart failure patients. That's why we're having the program today. And our next two speakers will address this and hopefully give us some suggestions for improving this compliance and getting better care for heart failure. And with that, I will go to our next speaker. So if you could put up on the slide the introduction for our next speaker, uh, I would, uh, that would be appropriate. So, <clears throat> I think it's there. And so I'm delighted to introduce our next speaker who's going to tell us how to get out of this jungle. And that is uh, Andrew Ambrosi, who is a cardiologist at the Permanente <clears throat> Medical Group in San Francisco. He's the Associate Program Director for Research and Medical Director Assistant uh, for Clinical Trials at Kaiser. And I know that he was intricately involved in some of these trials. He, we are happy to introduce him today. His full introduction is shown here, but I will introduce him as an outstanding individual and to, because we're a little behind on time, uh, we'll come back to this, but I'm sure you'll uh, realize during his talk that he knows what he's talking about, about heart failure and I'm happy to introduce uh, Andrew Ambrosi now to present medications and trials that are very inspiring related to heart failure. Andrew. Great, thank you much, so much, Dr. Bomber, for that very warm introduction. Um, give me a second just to share my screen. Are you guys able to see my screen now? Yes. Fantastic. Um, so as, uh, as Dr. Bomber already said, um, I'm Andrew Ambrosi. I'm a practicing cardiologist at Kaiser Permanente San Francisco. I'm also a clinician investigator and the assistant medical director for clinical trials at our regional division of research in Oakland. And today I have uh, the privilege of presenting on guideline directed medical therapy for heart failure, recent updates from clinical trials. Uh, so just by way of, um, of introduction, so I do have a few conflicts. So I do have some funding from the NIH to do heart failure related research. I also have some industry support from, uh, from a, a device and a drug manufacturer that has a vested interest in the heart failure space, um, but I won't be discussing any off-label uses in this talk. And honestly, I think that my, you know, my biggest conflict of interest is that I'm passionate about heart failure and clinical trials. And I really do enjoy this material. And I think that that's um, you know, really the main bias that I bring to this material. Some learning objectives for the talk. So at the conclusion of this activities, learners will understand 
The evidence basis for angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibitors in acute and chronic heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction. The clinical trial data supporting the use of sodium glu glucose co-transport 2 inhibitors in heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction, irrespective of prior history of diabetes mellitus. And finally, the emerging role of angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibitors for select and sodium glucose co-transporter 2 inhibitors for most patients with heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction. So Dr. Balmer already touched on this a little bit, but uh, there are you know, really two main phenotypes of heart failure. So in the center of the screen, you see a normal heart, and we tend to distinguish between the two types of heart failure based on their ejection fraction. That is the proportion of blood that's pumped with each beat. So we have heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction, which, which what happens with that is as the heart ages and gets older, it thickens and gets stiffer and it doesn't relax well. So that's primarily a problem with relaxation of the heart. And on the left-hand side of the screen, we have heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction or systolic heart failure. And that's a process by which the heart dilates over time and gets weaker. So really distinguishing between these two types of heart failure is primarily based on the ejection fraction, and it probably doesn't really do it justice, but for better or worse, this is the way most of the clinical trials have been organized and the way the guidelines have been written. So it's a very you know, useful way to classify patients in your mind. Now, a bit about the epidemiology of heart failure. So heart failure is a big problem. I used to say that, that heart failure was a global pandemic and then we actually had a pandemic. And so I've, I've had to re revise my terminology, but it's a big problem across the globe. In the US alone, there's about 6 million patients with heart failure and there's projections that that number is gonna balloon to more than 9 million patients by the year 2030. So it's a big problem and it's getting bigger. Shown here on this slide are some <laughs> internal data. Is somebody saying something? may have just been a, an accident. Um, so on this slide is shown some internal data from Kaiser Permanente, Northern California. And I want you to focus in on this black line right here in the center. And this shows the number of hospitalizations for worsening heart failure indexed to the total number of hospitalizations. So although the prevalence is going up, the relative proportion of hospitalizations for worsening heart failure has also increased over time. And currently, there's about a million hospitalizations for heart fa failure on an annual basis in the United States. This is huge. This is second only to pregnancy. And if you take only those patients that are greater than or equal to 65 years of age, it's the most common reason for hospital admission. Now, it starts to get interesting when we look at patients by ejection fraction. So in panel A here, I have patient heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction, and you can see the curves are relatively flat. Heart failure with a mid-range ejection fraction, which is the group that's somewhat between half ref and half PEF and accounts for about 10% of heart failure, also pretty flat. But when you look at heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction, this is really where, um, where most of heart failure is these days. And it's the fastest growing segment of the population. So it's really taking off both in terms of absolute numbers as well as the relative proportion of heart failure. Now, this is a complicated slide showing a timeline of all landmark heart failure trials. Obviously, I'm not gonna cover all of these today. I'm actually just gonna cover a few of them. But you can think about clinical development for heart failure is clustering around three main eras. So in the 1980s and early 1990s, we had the era of diuretics and vasodilators. In the 1990s, uh, up to the early 2000s, uh, there were a lot of landmark tri clinical trials in heart failure that were done, and really the management changed um, quite dramatically. We then had kind of a drop off in heart failure. Uh, there were some trials that were done, but you know nothing that was really practice changing. And then from 2015 onwards, there's been a number of new clinical trials in heart failure. And really over the last five years in this contemporary era is where I'm going to spend the majority of my time. And the management of heart failure has changed quite dramatically, as well as the prognosis. So this slide shows some of the foundational therapies for heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction. It really organizes around five main pathways in the in four drugs that we refer to now as really being the pillars of management for heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction. 
And you know, with, with these medications, heart failure has really been transformed from a condition that was almost universally fatal within five years to a condition that people can live with for decades now. So it's, it's really um, quite impressive. On the periphery of these slides, you can see some other emerging therapies for heart failure. And I'll just highlight that it's getting quite complicated. I mean, we have four first line therapies and we have five or six second line therapies now. And you know, heart failure is, for most of these patients, is not their only medical problem. So things have gotten much more complex. I'm going to show some of the same slides that uh, you know Dr. Bomber already shared, um, different figures, but from the same the same papers, because I'd like to think that great minds think alike. And he highlighted a lot of the same evidence that I'll comment on. So this slide shows the use of guideline-directed medical therapies for HEFREF at baseline. And if you look at these last three columns over here. So in yellow, we have patients that have a documented contraindication to one of these medications, less than 1% for most of these medications. In green, we have patients that are treated. And as Dr. Palmer highlighted, this is far below the 80% that we like to see with some of these guideline recommendations. And in red, we have without contra contraindication and not treated. So this is really the gap here that we need to fill. And you can see that for the aldosterone antagonists, I mean, this number is as high as 65%. 65% of patients that are eligible for this therapy are not receiving it. But as Dr. Bomber also highlighted, uh, although they're not receiving it at baseline, they also weren't receiving it at follow-up. So these graphs get a little complicated to follow, but in red, we have, we have basically stable medication use, no change in either direction. In green, they're stable at target. And then in blue and in yellow, uh, either initiate or dose increase or discontinue or dose decrease. And essentially, the minority of patients undergo any kind of initiation or discontinuation of a therapy or a dose change. For every patient that, has an, uh, that is newly initiated or has a dose increase, there's a patient to offset them that has the drug discontinued or a dose decrease. So effectively, we have you know, clinical inertia. There's no real change here. But as Dr. Bomber highlighted, what would happen if we implemented these medications? So here we have in blue comprehensive therapy and in red conventional therapy. Conventional therapy is either being on, an, a, beta, is being on a beta blocker and an ACE or an ARB, and comprehensive therapy is being on those four pillars that are part of modern medical therapy for HEFREF. And you can see that the difference in survival between the two groups across all age groups is over six years with a 95% confidence interval that ranges from three and a half years to almost nine years. So patients will get almost another six years of life if we just got them on the right medications. We have great medications, we're just not using them. So I'm gonna transition and go through some data for some of the, the foundational therapies for heart failure. I'm gonna focus on two classes of medications today, the ARNIs, the angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibitors, and the SGL2, the sodium glucose co-transporters too and I'll present the data for their use in patients with heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction, followed by heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction. So first I'll go through ARNIs and HEFREF. So what is an ARNI? It's um, a medication called Secubitra Velsartan. It's not a combination drug. It's a single drug that's been covalently bonded to one another. And in short, it blocks the bad neurohormones that cause vasoconstriction and salt and fluid retention. And in it Sorry, the lights are going off in my office. And it enhances the good neurohormones, the ones that cause vasodilation and salt and fluid removal from the body. So the first trial I'll talk about is Paradigm HF. So this was a double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized clinical trial. Largest trial ever done in HEFREF, over 8,000 patients. They had to have an ejection fraction less than or equal to 40%, be symptomatic, have elevated natriuretic peptides, which... Um, is, um, is a marker of heart failure severity and have stable medication dosing for the last four weeks. They were e either started on Secubitro Valsartan, the ARNI, or continued on the gold standard ACE inhibitor, Enalapril. The primary outcome was cardiovascular death or hospitalizations for heart failure. And cardiovascular death is underlined here because that's what the study was powered for. It was designed to detect a difference in that endpoint. And patients were followed for a median of 27 months. It was an event-driven trial, meaning that it continued until an appropriate number of events were accumulated so that you could detect a difference between the groups if, in fact, there was one. 
And cutting right to the chase here, there was a significant difference between patients receiving enalapril and patients randomly assigned to receive Secubitra Valsartan. So there was an absolute risk reduction of about 5% between the two groups during follow-up, a relative risk reduction of about 20%, so meaning a, a relative reduction in risk of that magnitude, and a number needed to treat of, of about 21. So what does this mean? This means that if, if you treated 21 patients for a year, you would expect to have prevented either one cardiovascular death or one hospitalization for heart failure. So a pretty big difference. Now, looking at some of the secondary endpoints, so there was a difference in, in death due to cardiovascular causes. There was also a difference in death due to all cause. And this is pretty significant. So p-value less than 0.01, an absolute difference of about uh, 3% between the two groups. There are only 10 medications in cardiovascular disease that have been found to, to reduce all cause death. So quite impressive. There was also an improvement in quality of life. Um, so we use a, in heart failure, we use a research tool known as the KCCQ to assess uh, quality of life in patients. And this was a statistically significant difference between the two groups. I think it's unclear whether it's clinically significant or not, and there's probably still some room for improvement here, but, uh, but definitely an, an impressive reduction in clinical outcomes. Now let's look at side effects, because I think that this is often something that's you know, very relevant to both patients and providers. Now, the big difference between Secubitra Valsartan and Enalapril was in the incidence of symptomatic uh, hypotension and uh, symptomatic hypotension with a, with a reduced blood pressure. There really was quite a big difference between the two groups, and uh, patients that were on Secubitra Valsartan had a higher incidence of hypotension, and this is probably the Achilles heel of the medication. That being said, since the drug was approved, the manufacturer actually rolled out with a lower dose, so there's a high, medium, and low dose, and you can now start patients on this lowest dose and you should select it based on blood pressure. And this really does serve to mitigate the difference in uh, the instance of hypotension between the two groups. Another helpful thing is that since Secubitra Valsartan also leads to some loss of salt and water from the body, you can also down titrate a patient's diuretic dose and really minimize the risk of hypotension. But in terms of acute kidney injury and hyperkalemia, that tended to favor Secubitra Valsartan, and we saw less of that, which often is a limit to starting one of these medications and then up titrating it. We also saw that there were, was less uh, cough related to these medications, which can, which can be a big issue with ACE inhibitors. And the final point I'll make here is that Secubitra Valsartan, as well as ACE inhibitors, both affect the metabolism of bradykinins. So if you're gonna switch a patient from an ACE inhibitor to an ARNI, you need to have a 36 hour washout period. So that's just a little clinical pearl when you're changing patients over. So you'll need to have them hold a few doses before they can safely be transitioned over to the new medication. Now I'm gonna switch gears and talk about another trial of ARNIs and HEFREF, which I think is, uh, distinguishes it from, from some of the other medications that have been developed. So the Pioneer HF trial, which I was quite involved in, was a double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized clinical trial, which also included an, an open-label extension phase in addition to a double-blind treatment phase. So at the end of the study, everybody was on the new medication. What's unique about this is this wasn't done in patients with stable and ambulatory heart failure. This was 881 hospitalized patients with a reduced ejection fraction who were post-stabilization, so they had to have a stable blood pressure and be on stable diuretic doses. And these patients were also enrolled irrespective of prior heart failure history and prior ACE-ARB status. So they could have had a new diagnosis of heart failure or they could have been treatment naive. It compared Secubitra Valsartan again to enalapril. And here, since it was a smaller study, uh, we used a surrogate endpoint. So we looked at the proportional change in N-terminal pro-BMP, which as I mentioned, is a surrogate marker for the severity of heart failure. So this is a bad marker. So think about this like your bad cholesterol. You want to see a lower number. It was a short-term study. So there was an eight-week um, double-blind treatment phase followed by a 12-week open-label phase where, pay, where everybody, even the patients that were initially on enalapril, were switched over to Secubitra Valsartan. Now this slide shows the primary outcome. So at the end of the eight-week double-blind treatment phase, the patients randomly assigned to receive Secubitra Valsartan had much lower N-terminal pro-BMP levels compared to the patients that were randomly assigned to 
to randomly assigned to receive enalapril. Importantly, although the study wasn't designed to look at clinical outcomes, we did see a difference in outcomes between the two groups in a period of time as short as eight weeks. So the left-hand panel looks at the cumulative instance of cardiovascular death or rehospitalization for heart failure. And we see an absolute risk reduction of 6%, a relative risk reduction of 42%, very impressive, and a number needed to treat of 17. So you only needed to treat 17 patients for eight weeks to prevent one of these endpoints. Quite impressive. Right-hand panel of the slide shows the cumulative incidence of rehospitalizations for heart failure in very similar numbers here, impressive over a very short follow-up period. Now, switching gears, this is a paper that I had the privilege of leading. So as I mentioned before, one of the things that distinguished Pioneer HF from other clinical trials is that patients could have been enrolled irrespective of prior heart failure history and prior treatment status. So on the left-hand side in the pie graph, you can see that only about 40% of patients had a prior history of heart failure and were receiving an ACE or an ARB at baseline. So the remaining 60% of patients either didn't have a history of heart failure or hadn't previously been treated. And now when we shift over here to the right-hand side, when we look at those four groups, we can see that there were some differences in the change in N-terminal pro BMP with each respective groups, but the relative difference between secubitril valsartan and enalapril was preserved across all of these groups. So the takeaway here is don't wait. Whether patients have a prior history of heart failure or whether they're treatment naive or not, they derive a similar benefit from ARNIs compared to conventional ACE inhibitors. And that's a very powerful message. Don't wait to treat. Also going along with that message, we looked at the clinical events in patients, not only during the double blind treatment phase, but also in the open label extension phase. So here you can see the patients randomly assigned to enalapril, who then transitioned to secubitril valsartan, and the patients that were started on secubitril valsartan and then continued on it during the open label extension phase. And what I'll point out here is that although N-terminal pro-BMP levels came down to similar levels in both groups when we transitioned from the double blind treatment phase to the open label extension phase, this delta in terms of clinical outcomes you can never make up that difference. So the early separation in curves continues in the open label extension phase. So in your mind, you should think about this as, as starting in hospital versus starting post-discharge. There's no reason to wait to start post-discharge because you will never recruit, recoup that benefit on clinical events of starting this medication in hospital. Ooh. So that was a whirlwind in data. Let me see where I am on time. I'm taking up a lot of time, so I'm gonna have to pick up the pace. So I like to switch gears and talk about Arnie's and HEFPEF here. So we're gonna talk about the same class of medications, but we're gonna be fo focusing in on our patients with a preserved ejection fraction. So the landmark trial here was, so very similar design, about 5,000 uh, ambulatory patients, so outpatients, but they had to have a preserved ejection fraction. So greater than or equal to 45%. They did have to be symptomatic as well. And since HEF-PEF can be so difficult to characterize, they were also required to have some evidence of structural heart disease, excuse me, as well as to require diuretic therapy at baseline. In this case, secubitor valsartan was compared to just valsartan, so not an ACE inhibitor, an ARB in this case. Primary outcome was similar. And again, it was an event-driven trial that went on for you know, a few years. Now, Looking at the primary endpoint here, so the rate in the secubitril valsartan arm was 12.8 per 100 person years, and the rate in the valsartan arm was 14.6 per 100 person years. But we can see that the p-value here approached the level of statistical significance, but did not uh, achieve it. So we had, um, you know, border essentially borderline uh, statistical significance here. So it didn't quite reach the primary endpoint. That being said, the investigators really did a nice job of interrogating the data because I think you'll so I think you'll see as I show some sensitivity analyses, some secondary endpoints, and some subgroup analyses that although this study didn't reach its primary endpoint, clinical trials are not black and white, and there were some some signals of benefit here. And I think we should still consider using this medication in select cases. 
So here, when they further interrogated the primary endpoint, when they looked at the primary analysis in this blue box here, again, it had a nominal p-value of 0 0.059, so it didn't quite reach it. But when they expanded the endpoint to also take into account not just cardiovascular mortality and hospitalizations for worsening heart failure, but also urgent heart failure visits, so ED visits, outpatient clinic encounters for worsening heart failure, it did reach the threshold for statistical significance with a relative risk reduction of about 15%. And again, when they expanded this endpoint to include not just the, the, the validated um, hospitalizations, but all investigator reported endpoints, so even those that didn't include enough source documentation to validate it, with that expanded number of endpoints, again, this did reach the threshold for statistical significance. In addition, there was some, encu some encouraging signs when some of the secondary endpoints were looked at. So there was an improvement in New York Heart Association functional class, which is a way of measuring symptoms in heart failure in the patients receiving Secuba to Valsartan versus Valsartan. There were a higher proportion that were improved and a lower proportion that were worsened. There were also was a higher proportion of patients that had, a, that had clinically significant improvement in quality of life among those receiving Secuba to Valsartan. And they were also less likely to have worsening renal function, which is a... Um, uh, a common complication of heart failure and associated with a poor prognosis. So again, some encouraging signs. Importantly though, I think that some fascinating signals began to emerge when we looked at different subgroup analyses. So this slide shows that there appeared to be a more robust benefit among women compared to men with a, clinic, with a statistically significant p-value. And there also seemed to be a greater benefit in those patients that had an ejection fraction below the median, 57%. So patients that had a preserved, but not quite normal EF. There also seemed to be a greater benefit in patients that were recently hospitalized. So this slide shows patients hospitalized within the last 30 days, and as well as at very other various other time points, all the way to patients never hospitalized. In blue, we have Valsartan, and, and in, sorry, in black, we have Valsartan, and in blue, we have Secubitra Valsartan. And you can see that you know, not unexpectedly, patients that were never hospitalized had lower event rates. But what I'd like to emphasize is that the delta between the groups is greater in patients that have had a recent hospitalization. So how do I integrate all these data? Just miss the primary endpoint, some encouraging secondary endpoints, some positive subgroup analyses. So the FDA gave a blanket approval to Secubitra Valsartan and basically said that clinicians can use discretion because there may be some groups that um, some subgroups that derive a more robust benefit. So my own personal practice is I start to think about using Secubitra Valsartan in HEFPEF patients who are one of three groups, either they're female, they have a preserved but not normal EF, so kind of the 50 to 60% range, or they have a recent hospitalization for heart failure. So those are the three select subgroups I'm starting to think about using this medication in. Now let's go ahead and switch gears and talk about SGL2 inhibitors in patients with heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction. So what is an SGL2 inhibitor? So it initially was developed as a diabetes drug. So this slide shows uh, the nephron, which is the functional unit of the kidney. And the way that glucose is handled by the kidneys is usually it's, it's filtered in the nephron, but then it's reabsorbed. So very little, very little glucose is actually removed from the body by kidneys, uh, by the kidneys. But what an SGL2 inhibitor does is it blocks that reabsorption process and it results in the removal of both glucose, sugar, and water from the body. Now, this is its basic mechanism and it's why it was thought to be a good diabetes drug and that it may have some benefits on cardiovascular disease. But it actually turns out that it's not a very good diabetes drug, um, but it turns out to be a wonderful cardioprotective medication probably for a lot of different me um, potential mechanisms of benefit that are beyond the scope of this talk, um, but it probably does a lot of things in the body. But let's talk about some of the trial evidence. So two main trials have been completed so far. Again, they're both double-blind placebo-controlled RCTs. They enrolled similar patient populations uh, to the prior HEFREF trials. And of note here is that patients were enrolled irrespective of prior history of diabetes mellitus. So although it was initially developed as a diabetes drug, patients were really enrolled irrespective of diabetes status. And in this case, there's no prior medication to, to compare it to. So the SGL2s 
dapagliflozin and empagliflozin were both compared just to matching placebo because this was not developed to replace a medication. It was, it was developed as an add-on therapy. And again, very similar uh, endpoint to what we've seen in prior studies, cardiovascular death, as well as um, hospitalizations for worsening heart failure and similar timeframe for follow-up. Now, jumping right to the main result here in Emperor Reduced on the, on the primary endpoint of cardiovascular death plus hospitalization for worsening heart failure, Again, very impressive benefit of empagliflozin compared to placebo. An absolute risk reduction of about 5%, a relative risk reduction of 25%, and a number needed to treat of approximately 20. So treat one patient, uh, sorry, treat 20 patients for one year and you'll have prevented one of these events. So quite impressive. The question we get um, often since this was initially developed as a, as a diabetes medication, well, is the benefit preserved in patients with and without diabetes? And absolutely yes. So this slide shows the EMPEROR and the DAPA trial among patients with diabetes, as well as patients without diabetes. And you can see here uh, that when we look at the pooled estimates of the hazard ratios, which is an estimate of the benefit of this above and beyond placebo, it's, it's really no different between patients with and without diabetes. So we really shouldn't be considering diabetes at all when we think about using this medication as a, um, as a heart failure drug. Interesting clinical pearl here. Um, when this medication is started, so this slide is showing the change in, in EGFR, the estimated glomerular filtration rate. So that's a measure of kidney function. So in both placebo and in patients receiving placebo and patients receiving empagliflozin, there was a reduction in kidney function over time. But what's interesting here is that there's a, a quick dip in kidney function with the empagliflozin, and it, and it then recovers over time and actually leads to renal protective effects. So the point that I would make here is that this is an, this early dip in the EGFR, that's a lab finding. That's not a real thing. It's just that it, there's a removal of, of glucose and fluid from the body that causes some hemoconcentration. And this um, G, GFR appears to decline transiently. But over the long term, this is a renal protective medication. So we really shouldn't be stopping it for that reason. So very important clinical finding here. I'll also say that side effects were quite well. We're having just a little bit of difficulty hearing Dr. Ambrosi. I'm wondering if Dr. Bomber can come on and explain this slide or Earl So. Can you uh, take a crack at it while we wait for Dr. Ambrosi to recover his um, audio. Okay, so uh, uh, as soon as you're back on, Andrew, let us know. Um, but uh, Andrew is now in the Emperor Reduced trial looking at safety. And I think as he mentioned uh, that we've all seen the side effect profile of the SGLT2s is really pretty good and safety is uh, quite well uh, established in these trials. Uh, can we go back to, can we put his slide back up at this point? But anyways, uh, <clears throat> while we're waiting for that slide uh, <clears throat> on the Emperor Reduced trial, uh, I can tell you that safety showed that <clears throat> the side effect profile compared to placebo was pretty close to placebo across the way for it. Uh, so we want to go to the side effect profile one. <laughs> uh, and basically it showed that compared to placebo on the right and empagliflozin, uh, those numbers are, are off by a fraction of a percent for almost everything with the, with the exception of genital infections. So genital yeast infections go up uh, in individuals who are on the empagliflozin somewhat, not the complicated ones, but just general infections double in those individuals. That has been handled and is actually much less in emperor reduced than it was in the emperor reg trial. And the reason for that is during emperor reduced, the investigators emphasize the importance of hygiene for any kind of a therapy where there's going to be increased glucose in the urine 
And if it is not, if they don't practice hygiene and that glucose gets on the skin, there's a chance of genital skin infections, which can be handled with, uh, with uh, <clears throat> ointments and with lotions uh, for the fungus. So pretty good safety profile, as he said, with this efficacy. Uh, can you advance to the next slide? Um, <clears throat> So this, while we're waiting for uh, Andrew to get on board, is the SGLT2s in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. <laughs> uh, he mentioned that the original pathway is just uh, inhibition of the absorption of glucose in the kidney uh, for that. But we now are aware that there are many other cardioprotective mechanisms that may be involved with that. And because of that, and I see Andrew back online. Andrew, do you want to take over for all of these mechanisms of which we know about 10, but there may be another 10 unexplored at this point in time. So Andrew, back to you. Uh, thank you so much. Are you guys able to see me and, uh, and hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, uh, fantastic. Um, should I try to share my screen or should I just use this, you think? Uh, let's use this one for now. Okay, perfect. Well, I, I sincerely apologize for that. My computer froze and that's never happened. Um, so I believe we're on to SGL2s and HEPPEF. And Dr. Bomber, not knowing my slide, picked up without missing a beat. Um, so let's go ahead and go on to the next slide. All right. So the last clinical trial we're going to cover is Emperor Preserved. Um, so this was a double-blind, placebo-controlled RCT. About 6,000 outpatients with HEF-PEF. Um, they had to be symptomatic, and they had to have some kind of structural heart disease. Similar to what we saw with Emperor Reduced, it was empagliflozin versus matching placebo. And again, a very similar outcome. So cardiovascular death plus hospitalizations for heart failure and a follow-up of about a couple of years. Next slide, please. And again, similarly, the outcomes were quite impressive. So we had a hazard ratio of 0 0.79, um, corresponding to a relative risk reduction of about 21% and a number need to treat of 31. So a little bit larger than HEFREF, but you know, again, fairly impressive results. And you can see that the separation of the curves was quite early on. Next slide, please. Again, we do see this pesky lab artifact where there's a transient dip in the GFR before it comes back up with empagliflozin. But again, what I'll emphasize to you here is this is just a lab artifact. This is not a reason to stop the medication. And there's very robust evidence that this medication preserves kidney function over the long term, which is very, very important to both our CKD patients as well as our heart failure patients. Next slide. Interestingly, we did see some improvements in quality of life as measured by the KCCQ in both patients that uh, were on treatment as well as, um, uh, as, well as um, patients for whom we had some missing data. Um, so that was quite encouraging because the half half patients do have a very high burden of symptoms and in, in impaired quality of life, even compared to their, their half ref um, counterparts. Next slide. And interestingly here, when we looked at uh, New York Heart Association functional class, we saw that uh, patients receiving empagliflozin compared to placebo, they, they were more likely to have an improvement and they were less likely to have a deterioration in their symptomatic status. And this effect occurred pretty early on. I mean, we started to see some signals of benefit as early as 12 weeks. So, you know, perhaps in contrast to sacubitrofalsarin and some of the other classes of medications, you know, really some robust evidence emerging that it not only improves uh, hard clinical outcomes, but also quality of life and functional status, which is very important to patients. Next slide. Now, this just frames the results of Emperor Preserve compared to other HEFPEF, landmark HEFPEF trials. And you can see that for most of them, uh, there, the, the, the statistical significance was not there. So they didn't meet the primary endpoint and we don't use these medications. And so not only was Emperor Preserved statistically significant, but it also had the largest point estimate of the relative risk reduction, about 20%. So comparable to what we saw in HEFREP. Next slide. And that's exactly what this slide wants to emphasize. So, so some of the, 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 the primary endpoint, as well as its components and some key secondary endpoints, really no difference between with empagliflozin in a, in a HEF-REF versus a HEF-PEF population. So it really does set this class of medications apart in terms of its benefit among HEF-PEF patients. Next slide. 
And this finding was quite robust, even when we started to hit some of the higher levels of ejection fraction. So unlike Paragon HF and Sucubitra Valsartan, where we saw that there was diminished benefit as the EF got higher, it really wasn't until we got to an EF greater than or equal to 65% that we saw there was a loss of benefit of empical flows and versus placebo. And at that point, you know, really there were so few patients in this, in this range that it's, it's hard to know. So, you know, contrasting this to other therapies, really robust finding across all pre-specified subgroups. Next slide. So coming to the end, so as I told you at the beginning, at the conclusion of this activity, learners will understand the evidence basis for angiotensin receptor neprilysis inhibitors in acute and chronic heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction, the clinical trial data supporting the use of SGL2 inhibitors in HEFREF, irrespective of prior diabetes, in the emerging role of ARNIs for SELECT and SGL2 inhibitors for most patients with heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction. Next slide. So in conclusion, ARNIs are superior to their predecessors and should be considered first line for HEFREF, irrespective of duration of diagnosis and prior treatment status, and can be safely initiated prior to discharge. SGL2 inhibitors reduce morbidity and improve survival in HEFREF, and should be implemented irrespective of prior history of diabetes. And finally, we now have two classes of medication that we can consider in HEFPEF patients. So ARNIs may be considered in high-risk patients, so either those with a below normal ejection fraction or a recent hospitalization, and SGL2s should be considered in most HEFPEF patients. Next slide. So again, thank you so much. Despite the technical difficulties with Dr. Bomber's support, I came in right on time and, um, and thank you for having me. It really was a privilege to be here today. Nice teamwork, everybody. And thank you for that wonderful presentation. I wonder if just uh, we should go ahead into Dr. So's presentation and hold the questions to the end. Uh, Dr. Bomber, what is your recommendation? Yeah, I think we can do that. Uh, Andrew, are you available for the next uh, 20 minutes, 30 yes, minutes? Yes, of course. No, no, definitely. All I'll right. stay on the line. Thank you both. So uh, we will entertain questions to all of the speakers uh, as soon as Earl finishes. So we're delighted to move on to the next step of our presentation. Uh, Earl So is uh, the medical director of primary and ambulatory care at the LA Ambulatory Care Center via Greater Los Angeles Healthcare System. He manages a lot of patients. Uh, we talked about uh, over 70,000 patients uh, are waiting for him to finish this call so they can uh, see him at this point in time. He's clinical associate professor at the USC Keck School of Medicine. So uh, Earl has a distinguished performance that we can see here a specialist. Uh, he's been with the VA for a number of years and has specialized in a number of areas. And today is exciting because he's going to present to us some of the work the VA has done over the last year in response to COVID related to video conferencing and <clears throat> video medicine uh, for that. So telehealth is uh, an important thing that we've all become familiar with in the last year uh, during COVID. In addition to that, COVID, uh, telemedicine lends itself to heart failure as well. And he's gonna address some of the in, uh, advances that uh, the VA has produced in telehealth, including heart failure. And I personally know, uh, based on a relative, that the VA does a very good job in heart failure and they go out of their way to administer some of these things, including the team approach uh, that is incorporated in some of the VA aspects. Uh, tremendous success that they've had with that program. We're happy to have Earl here today to tell us about the program at the VA. Earl? All right. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction, and thank you for inviting me back. Um, as I said, I am a um, the medical director, but also I do deliver primary care. I was trained as an internist and um, very uh, passionate about treating the veterans. So next slide, please. So financial disclosures, I don't have any. I'm still hopeful, though. Next slide. 
And then I thought, um, Hattie mentioned that um, Thursday uh, this week is Veterans Day. And I thought the history of Veterans Day was kind of interesting. Um, so initially, um, our Mrs. Day was uh, named as a national holiday on November 11th. And our Mrs. Day really celebrated the end of fighting of World War I, which was considered to be you know, named as the Great War at that time. And fighting had ended at 11 o'clock on November 11th. So that was really the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. Um, the actual um, end of World War I didn't happen until the Treaty of Versailles was actually signed. Um, and I got a chance to visit the, the Palace of Versailles before COVID and was in the hall mirrors where actually the, the treaty was signed. So I was just struck by the uh, opulence and the grandness of, of the, uh, the Palace of Versailles though. So anyway, on uh, November of 1919, President Wilson proclaimed November 11th as the first day of uh, Armistice Day. And unfortunately, World War II happened in the 1940s. And it, actually, uh, this, there's a typo in this slide. In 1947, uh, Raymond Weeks, who was a World War II veteran, had organized a National Veterans Day to uh, celebrate the veterans, to honor all the veterans um, on November 11th, on Armistice Day, which was it, what it's called at the time. And um, just like the great practices that are uh, spread in this forum, um, this actually spread was, was caught on and actually became a bill that was signed into law that our Mrs. Day was changed to Veterans Day. Uh, that was in 1954. And for Mr. Weeks, all of his efforts and all of his um, support with the veterans, um, he actually was awarded the, uh, awarded the Presidential Citizens Medal by President Reagan. So uh, next slide, please. So just a little bit of background about the veteran demographics. Currently, there's about 19 and a half million veterans. 90% um, are men, about 10% are women. Uh, the average age of the veteran population right now is a little bit less than 65. And the average age actually has been declining. And I'll tell you that why on the next slide. And our population uh, by race is listed there. Um, the total veteran population that uses the VA system is about half of that total veteran population. It's about 9 million uh, veterans use the VA system for their health care. So next slide, please. So the largest group of veterans was the World War II veterans. Um, they numbered 16 million at their peak. And as you can see here, there's less than 300,000 World War II veterans left. Um, they're in their 90s and 100s at this point. Um, so they are um, you know, dying off at a, a rapid rate at this time. The largest group of living veterans that we have right now are the Gulf War veterans, the younger veterans at 8.1 million. And so next slide, please. So this is just an overview of the telehealth modalities that we commonly use at the VA and just wanted to go over these briefly. So clinical video telehealth, um, this is where telemedicine is delivered from the medical center, usually a hospital with a specialist to an outlying clinic. So it's really telemedicine um, to a smaller clinic the patient would be at the smaller clinic uh, with, in front of a video monitor and receiving telemedicine. Um, store and forward is uh, asynchronous telemedicine where uh, things would be caught on either a uh, picture or some other for form that's stored and uh, sent forward. So it'd be like a diabetic teleretinal pictures that are taken that are, are stored and then forwarded to the ophthalmologist to be read at a later time. Um, that's a store and forward. Secure messaging is our email uh, platform that we use for veterans, um, where veterans can communicate with the providers, with their healthcare team directly. And the Annie app for veterans is a um, self-help app that's loaded onto smartphones or, or, or computers. And this is a really a app that uh, allows veterans to uh, be more educated about their own illness. There are many different uh, conditions which, uh, that are part of this any app and veterans can load up their own uh, data onto this app um, for really to share with their providers at a later time. Um, coordination, home telehealth, VA Video Connect and Teletuck, Teletuck Tuck In. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about these more in depth. Um, Next slide, please. 
So care coordination home telehealth, this is really our um, remote monitoring system. And this really allows us to monitor our patients who are at home and to monitor more carefully, more frequently than they, we could otherwise. And this is through um, devices that are lended to the veterans. In front of this veteran here, we have uh, two devices. One device actually has a video camera on it, um, but th th these are lended to the veterans and they input information into these devices or can speak on, on these devices uh, to help other uh, healthcare staff. So next slide, please. So um, the staff that is monitoring all the information that comes out of the home telehealth uh, care coordination devices are the, the uh, nurses. Um, the nurses will follow symptoms, uh, biometric data that, that's shared. And really this allows frequent monitoring and assessment of these patients who are living at home. And these are really uh, high risk patients um, with um, various illnesses. And it does allow um, the healthcare team to make changes in um, their uh, medications or other therapies uh, on a more rapid basis. And really this does allow our patients to live at home uh, more frequently, um, living at home independently and alone uh, more frequently than they would otherwise. And next slide, please. So there is a main device um, that is um, uh, usually it's cell phone or landline connected, and there are various peripherals that are connected to the home telehealth machine. And the peripheral devices could include things such as a peak flow meter, a glucometer, a pulse oximeter. Um, that was very important during COVID time that we would uh, have a pulse oximeter available for our patients. Uh, a blood pressure cuff, weight scale, pedometer, thermometer, and stethoscope. These are just some of the peripherals that could be attached to the home telehealth machine. And next slide, please. So our RN care coordinators, um, they review with the patients and decide which devices are best suited to each patient based upon what illnesses the patient would have. And this is usually by referral from the primary care team or through other specialty teams um, to um, deliver this uh, home telehealth care to, to the patient. Um, so the RN care coordinator, they will train the patient uh, along with the caregiver to how to use the machines, along with uh, setting healthcare goals. Um, each uh, patient would be given a goals of, as to how they would uh, improve their health. And a large part of the home telehealth um, program is really giving feedback and to help educate the patients and to really promote self-care. Um, so that our care coordinators would also receive the data and risk stratify each patient on a regular basis based upon the data that received. Um, and they will go provide ongoing support to the patients and caregivers. So if there was a case where the, the patient showed signs of um, worsening based upon either symptoms or based upon data, the iron care coordinators would contact these patients um, in many cases would help the patient self-monitor their own condition, or if necessary, arrange additional treatment, including arranging different appointments, contacting the patient's providers. Um, and there's also uh, NPs who are part of this program who are actually scoped to make medication changes. So for those patients who might have diabetes or hypertension, for example, um, and it turned out their diabetes and hypertension wasn't that well controlled, they could go ahead and make medication titration changes. And next slide, please. So the um, diseases that are part of what we monitor in our home telehealth program include our poorly controlled diabetes, congestive heart failure, uh, poorly controlled blood pressure, our COPDs with uh, more severe symptoms, um, mental health patients who have depression or PTSD, uh, weight management, um, substance abuse, and our COVID-19. Um, Really, um, for many of these patients, um, many of our patients still live alone, and especially during the pandemic, um, they sometimes did feel like they were alone and isolated. And this really provided them a little, little bit of a feeling of being more connected to their healthcare team. Um, in patients with uh, COVID or suspected COVID, um, really did uh, 
provide reassurance to these patients and we were able to monitor them. In the case that they did uh, get worse, we could actually um, get them uh, the needed care sooner than, than, than possible than with the usual uh, care. Okay, next slide, please. So for a patient with diabetes, we would get, uh, track our biometric data, including glucose readings, finger sticks, blood pressure readings, uh, the patient's weight. Um, the RN uh, care coordination managers um, would also ask the veterans, I mean, there would be a protocol that would be used. So there'd be automated questions that would come up, um, such as, do you have any new sores on your feet or legs? Are you taking the, your diabetes medications as ordered? And the patient would input the answers um, to these questions. And basically they would come to the nurse, the RN care coordinator, and they would uh, review these questions and, and um, take action if needed. So next slide, please. So VA Video Connect is our platform for uh, video, uh, video visits with our patients um, at home. So this is really our way to provide uh, synchronous video and audio kind of like FaceTime or Doximity, if people use that, um, to provide telemedicine visits. And um, so during COVID time, our use of VA Video Connect um, really increased markedly, it increased about tenfold. Um, we were actually doing video visits before COVID. We all were, were set up for uh, video visits and um, it, it wasn't in a huge use at the time, but uh, VA Vita Connect just increased that markedly during the pandemic. Okay, next slide, please. So this is an example of our setup that we have for our Video Video Connect. Uh, we would um, have a provider who would have two monitors. Um, one monitor would be um, looking at the patient. Another monitor would be looking at the healthcare um, chart. Um, along with uh, needing a uh, um, microphone and camera. So um, the nice thing about this um, VA Video Connect is that we were able to communicate with uh, multiple people on, on the video call, including caregivers which, who could be at a different location, um, either other healthcare providers, healthcare staff who would be in, in different locations. Okay, next slide, please. And um, we do have a program called our Teletuck-In program. So at the VA, we do have a, a call center that fields um, many calls from patients, um, patients with various questions, various um, symptoms, and basically they get advice from the nurses through the call center. Well, the call center also performs outgoing calls to patients who might need a, additional um, help, additional assessment, additional reminders. Um, so the, the call center does perform these calls, uh, especially you know, when um, the patients might be um, at home alone again um, during a weekend where the patient was discharged or just recently seen in the emergency room and there might be a weekend coming up. So the, the call center nurses will place full phone calls just to check up on the, the patient. And our goals is really to decrease decrease patients uh, coming back into triage or coming back to the emergency room, trying to improve the care coordination, improve the quality of care, improve our patient satisfaction. Again, this is really not for acute medical conditions, but really trying to just check up on the patient, make sure they're doing okay. Next slide, please. So some of the conditions treated uh, from our Teletuck-In program for diabetic education, um, it's really, um, a lot of it is education on diet, on education on how to use the glucometer and making sure that the patient is doing the finger sticks on a regular basis, checking on medication compliance, and also um, having the patient performing self-care, uh, looking at their skin care and other things. Um, for hospital discharge, a lot of it is um, assessing the, whether the pain control is adequate, um, the, whether the patient is uh, resuming a regular diet, whether they've been able to uh, urinate, have a bowel movement, um, so making sure that they're uh, not having any additional problems after, after hospital discharge. Um, for the, our mental health patients, a lot of the, uh, what the teletuck in nurses do, they actually provide a lot of emotional support uh, for our patients. 
um, and also check to see how the patients are uh, doing in terms of uh, many other symptoms. For our palliative care patients, a lot of it is checking our, for pain, checking for symptoms, additional symptoms, and for emotional support. For our post-op patients, um, what they'll do is they'll also ask about wound uh, checks, looking for various infections, uh, asking about pain control again, uh, asking about nutritional uh, status, where the patients are eating well, um, and, and um, just making sure the patients have appropriate follow-up too. Uh, but a lot of what they do is uh, just reminder calls, reminding patients to take their medications, um, especially those patients who have had, had problems um, in the past with compliance, reminding, reminding the patients to do finger sticks and blood pressure checks and weight checks. Um, so this is uh, by referral. These patients are referred by uh, the primary care team or urgent care or from um, the hospital discharge team. Um, so one thing about hospital discharge, we also do have a goal of having each patient who has been discharged from the hospital, um, having the primary care team reach out and contact these patients uh, within 48 hours just to make sure that they're doing okay and to making sure that um, they have the medications that they need and, and making sure no other problems arise. And next slide, please. So um, turning to heart failure, as Dr. Brosey said, about 6.2 million adults in the US have heart failure. Um, heart failure is a um, illness that has a high mortality, high morbidity, and very high cost. Um, about 13% of the deaths um, in the U.S. Uh, were this is heart failure as being the, their main cause. Um, and I think this, co this cost here is a little bit outdated in 2012, but $30 billion here in 2012 was attributed to heart failure. In the VA system, um, again, about 13% of our deaths are from heart failure, and about 2.6 veterans um, are diagnosed with heart failure. So uh, next slide, please. So why might telehealth be helpful in the treatment of heart failure? Well, for one thing is that it may increase our um, agility to treat our patients, our nimbleness in getting, uh, getting our patients uh, treated appropriately um, and, and, and getting uh, information uh, passed on. So our communication is quicker with in the virtual world where um, uh, patients might be at home and they might be able to send messages to the healthcare team um, that's received uh, in an instant. So um, with, help, with home monitoring, also we're able to attain frequent data points on the patient stat status. I mean, not just biometric data, but also symptomatic data too. And um, this really lends itself perfectly for rapid medication initiation or rapid medication titration. Um, you know, we do take care of veterans that are really uh, far away um, in LA, we take care of veterans as far away as San Luis Obispo. So really um, travel is a major um, barrier for many of our patients. And so telehealth does remove a lot of this uh, travel and geographic barrier. Um, during this COVID time, uh, we're able to maintain some social distancing. And again, a lot of the telehealth is regarding um, trying to educate our patients, trying to improve our patient's self-care and self-management. So really this is a uh, modality that we are able to use uh, for this purpose of educating our patients better, um, really teaching our patients more about their illnesses and the treatments that, that they're on. Um, patients feel somewhat more empowered when they're able to take care of their own health um, in terms of um, checking their own vital signs, um, being able to relay that information um, to the healthcare team and able to really communicate with their healthcare team, knowing that there's some, there's a, uh, a some way that they can communicate with their healthcare team on a regular basis. Um, certainly um, adherence to medication is something that is promoted heavily uh, with um, telemedicine. Um, but overall, um, especially in heart failure, it's really the early detection of decompensation and early intervention um, that really, um, I think we're health uh, telehealth is beneficial, trying to deliver the right care at the right time. And telehealth may actually improve our healthcare system efficiency. Um, with telehealth, we, there's less of a need for um, clinical space, um, maybe less of a need for you know, parking structures, uh, parking spaces, 
even less of a need for um, you know uh, certain types of equipment that we have in an office, although we do need um, more telehealth equipment to, to go along with this. So next slide. So some of the barriers to telehealth. One, I mean, there is a um, equipment requirement uh, that's needed um, that has certain costs. There is um, uh, requirements for uh, literacy and technology. Um, and there is a, uh, a certainly a learning curve that goes along with learning all these uh, new systems, new technology. Um, patients do need to have somewhat of a stable living situation and they do need to be able to hook up these devices and have access to you know power and, and for these devices and space for these devices. Um, so um, also um, more healthcare resources may be needed uh, depending upon what type of staffing is used for these programs. Um, you know, in our monitoring system, uh, we did need to have hire more nurses to staff this program. Um, it is more work for patients. Uh, patients do have to um, have daily uh, uh, daily measuring of their um, metrics, biometrics, and inputting that information in. Um, you know, responding to the devices on a regular basis and you know, any questions that do come up. Um, it is more work for providers. Um, providers um, will get more um, information regarding all of their um, biometrics that is that are received from the patients. Um, some of this, much of this information may or may not be clinically relevant um, to the patients at that time. Um, so a lot of the information is gathered. Again, um, some of the, may, the information may not be all that helpful. And so, um, you know, I find that some of the providers really um, did not um, have an, much of enthusiasm to pursue um, telehealth or to order telehealth for their patients because of this reason. Um, reimbursement um, within the VA system, not that big of an issue, but certainly in the um, private world, uh, reimbursement telehealth can be an issue. Um, actually, I just saw my doctor um, not too long ago through telehealth, and it turned out my insurance company uh, did not want to reimburse uh, the doctor for this work, and I, right now I'm fighting my insurance company to do that. Um, the other issue is the unfair benefits. Um, if you look at the literature, um, you know, early on, there wasn't really a lot of good data showing the benefit of telehealth in, in many uh, illnesses. Um, you know, with heart failure, many of the heart failure patients are being taken care of um, at a high level at, already with the team approach. So um, it was really unclear whether adding additional expense like telehealth would improve their overall care and overall um, healthcare measures. So um, next slide, please. So adherence to telehealth is a uh, major issue. Um, it turns out about 30% of patients drop out of telehealth over time. And um, uh, this uh, Guzman, Ms. Guzman um, from LA, the VA LA, actually um, looked at those patients who uh, in telehealth and look, try to look at those patients who were more likely to drop out of telehealth. And it turns out those patients were older, had more functional impairments, had a higher probability of hospital admission or death, and were sicker for the most part. Um, and in this study, it was um, more likely to be white veterans compared to black, but that actually, um, there's been some studies that show the opposite of that too. So, but overall, we see that those patients who are older and sicker were more likely to drop out of telehealth. And it turns out that that's the population where we probably want them to keep them into telehealth, the, probably, the population that probably would benefit the most uh, from um, being in home telehealth. The population that, that had a lower risk of dropout were those patients who were using the VA's um, online portal already and were somewhat uh, computer literate. So they had a higher higher use of computers already. So next slide, please. So looking um, at, um, at many of the veterans don't have access to telehealth, but did not have access to the internet or did not have access to devices uh, to perform telehealth. 
the VA came out with a digital divide consult where the VA would actually um, let patients borrow a tablet such as, as an iPad um, that has a cellular service along with any peripheral devices that would be needed, including things like a BP monitor or scale or, or electronic stethoscope. Um, and from this, patients would be um, taught how to perform uh, telehealth visits and would be able to participate in telehealth. So this has been a very popular consult um, with uh, the patients who were not able to do telehealth beforehand. So next slide, please. So if we look at the evidence, um, like I said, uh, early on, many of the studies uh, did not show a benefit and so many of the studies were mixed onto the benefits of telehealth. And, and the same thing was so in heart failure that many of the studies were mixed as to what benefits there were. Um, it, it's somewhat hard to compare the different studies because many times there are different methods, different modalities, different uh, patient populations that are being looked at. Um, but also, some people have looked at uh, meta-analysis, trying to combine the different studies and looking at meta-analysis and systematic reviews. And, and looking at, at those, there have been several uh, meta-analysis that, that uh, has sh actually shown that telehealth and heart failure is associated with lower cardiac hospitalizations, lower all-cause hospitalizations, lower cardiac mortality, and lower all-cause mortality. And to next slide, please. So telehealth for heart failure is still evolving. It's still really at an early stage of widespread implementation. And um, the current uses of telehealth include things such as teleconsultation, consultation, which is um, the cons consultant or the, the, you know, the healthcare provider, um, being on telemedicine on one end with a patient on a tele, uh, video monitor on the other end. Um, and basically that happening like a regular clinic visit. Um, telemonitoring is being used more and more nowadays and trying to detect um, decomposition early on, trying to intervene early on. Um, a lot of times telemonitoring was a really not a effort that was coordinated with the cardiology team though. It, sometimes it was used as a, um, telemonitoring through the primary care team to monitor their patients um, uh, with heart failure. So uh, what really might be the next step is that so many centers do have a uh, multidisciplinary team to try to take care of their heart failure patients, um, their high risk heart failure patients at this time. Uh, uh, what might really might be the next step is having this multidisciplinary healthcare team integrating the use of telehealth to improve the delivery of care for their high-risk heart failure patients. And so next slide, please. So this is actually some recent work that was done at the VA uh, done this year. And um, the, the, the impetus for some of this work is that um, during the COVID time, time, we were actually seeing a higher rate of hospitalization for our heart failure patients during this time. And it was thought that, that that was due to you know many different reasons. Um, um, you know, one major reason is that many of the patients were afraid to come in, you know, to get their care, afraid to come into their clinics for regular clinic visits, afraid to come into um, to the pharmacy to get their medication. So a lot of it was just the, the lack of care for these patients. At least that was the thought. So um, this team came together and really um, they came together and did a performance improvement project looking at the high-risk uh, heart failure patients um, and seeing what we could do to try to improve their care. Um, the team included uh, Dr. Lynch, who is a general internist and a VA fellow with our National Clinical Scholars Program, um, Shelly DiFeralto, which is one of, was one of our nurse practitioners um, in our cardiology clinic. And I want to thank her. She really shared a lot of this information with me and Jessica Hillou, who's one of our uh, clinical pharmacists. So next slide, please. So what the team did is they first looked at those patients um, who they termed high risk heart failure. Um, and that definition included those patients who had two or more admissions in the, in the past year. And the admissions could, 
could be from heart failure, either diastolic or systolic, um, or you know, reduced ejection fraction or preserved ejection fraction in the past year. So we do have an electronic medical record at the VA. So they did do a search of these patients. Um, uh, the limiting factor is that this was only looking at the VA uh, hospital discharges. We do have many of our patients do have outside form, outside care, outside coverage, and may, some do, may end up at hospitals outside the VA um, and, and come back to the VA for care later on. But um, we did not; uh, the, the group did not was not able to look at those patients. So next slide, please. So um, looking at the chart review, um, they found 55 patients, 55 patients who had two or more uh, admissions for heart failure within the past year. And basically they were going to do a record review on these patients um, to find out what type of care they received and what was going on and see if there are any uh, gaps in care that could be improved. Um, they excluded from this analysis uh, four patients who died and moved, um, six patients who lived in long-term care, long care facility. Um, in a long-term care facility, um, the bulk of these patients' care was not done at the VA. Um, so that's why they excluded these patients. And then one patient who actually had a heart transplant um, during this time. So um, uh, with this, 44 patients with high-risk heart failure remained that they analyzed. So next slide, please. So of this 44, they try to identify any gaps of care, any, any um, uh, preventable causes um, as, of hospitalization. And the biggest cause that was identified were problems with medications, problems with refills, problems with adherence. It turns out um, some of the, the patients were self, had self-discontinued their heart failure medications, some were running out of medications and using the emergency room for refills. Um, some were who were discharged from the hospital um, recommending resumption of their medications, but the patients had no follow-up and that thus they ran out of medications and did not have any, any proper follow-up. Um, also with medications, sometimes changes to the medications would be made by different uh, doctors at different clinics and um, thus leading to decompensation and readmission for heart failure. Um, the next largest group had no consistent heart failure provider. So um, some patients had never been to cardiology clinic before, actually. Um, some had uh, multiple missed appointments. Um, some used their the emergency room as their main source of uh, care. And then the third gap they identified is that um, about a third of the patients lacked any type of uh, proper monitoring devices at home. They were unable to check their own blood pressures and check their weight um, at home. Um, another thing that was identified is that um, looking at these patients compared to those patients who were hospitalized um, only once, um, the patients with high risk heart failure were more likely to have a lower ejection fraction, uh, lower, uh, higher incidence of chronic kidney disease and more likely to be on multiple medications, more medications than those with uh, one uh, hospitalization heart failure. So um, looking at this group here, um, nine patients ha didn't have any of these gaps, whereas almost half of these patients had two or more gaps of these care gaps. So next slide, please. So what the team did is they, they really designed a project. Um, they presented this and, and uh, to the stakeholders. Uh, they put the team together and um, really they had um, two main secondary objectives. One was to have each one of these high-risk heart failure patients be assigned to a heart failure provider and to enlist the help of a telehealth nurse really to make sure these patients had devices that they could perform ongoing monitoring and um, really management of their symptoms while at home. And also to collaborate with the clinical pharmacist to improve medication management and compliance. Um, so this was the healthcare team where you had really the patient, the telehealth nurse, the clinical pharmacist, and the healthcare, the, the heart failure provider um, all working together as one team. So next slide, please. 
So the team proactively reached out to patients, um, to the high risk heart failure patients, and the patients who did sign up, um, they, their duty was to agree to use the heart failure equipment and to really to transmit uh, biometric data on a weekly basis and to answer heart failure questions on, I mean, uh, transmit the biometric data on a daily basis and really weekly to answer heart failure questions and to speak to the nurse on a weekly basis. Um, they also um, were able to speak to the pharmacist, speak to the provider as needed. And next slide, please. So the telehealth nurse received the biometric data from the patient on a daily basis, and they um, posted this into the medical record. Um, the telehealth nurse called the patient on a weekly basis and um, asked uh, specific heart failure questions um, on a regular basis and also when triggered by ch certain changes in the biometric data. Um, the, heart, the nurse also analyzed the, the data um, and basically notified other member of the team, the heart failure provider, uh, when the data was showing the patient was uh, possibly decompensating or when questions arose. Also, when there were questions regarding medications or when um, the patient uh, reported that they were, med they were running out of medications. The nurse uh, did contact the clinical pharmacist on the team too. Next slide, please. So the team actually looked at some of the questions um, that the telehealth nurses were previously asking um, the heart failure patients, and they revised uh, many of the questions to make it more specific to heart failure. And these, these questions were based on the American Heart Association Heart Failure um, Questionnaire. And so these questions included um, asking about such thing as dyspnea, orthopnea, um, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, swelling, um, lightheadedness, syncope, missed medication, um, also asking about their diet um, and their appetite. Next question, please. I mean, next slide, please. Um, and so this is an example of the biometric data that the telehealth nurses um, received and posted to the medical record. Um, so some biometric data, we see that includes uh, the weight, um, the blood pressure, the heart rate, um, and the pulse oximeter reading. Um, and we see the patient here actually missed a day of taking their weight. Again, we ask the patients try to do this on a daily basis, but you know we understand that patients sometimes they miss or, or sometimes they um, have other things that they're busy with, and and so um, uh, the nurse does try to call them on a weekly basis to try to remind them to perform the, the measurements on, on a daily basis. Uh, next slide, please. So the clinical pharmacist. Um, their duty included uh, medication reconciliation, making sure the patients had renewals and refills uh, when appropriate, also providing medication counseling, um, medication education to the patients whenever appropriate. Um, this included sometimes changing the labeling of some of the medications the patients were receiving. For example, if the patient was receiving uh, carbidolol, um, the indication for carbidolol on, on the patient's uh, prescription bottle may say for blood pressure, but um, when this was seen by the pharmacist, the pharmacist may have changed this to heart failure, you know, um, carbidolol for the heart um, as an instruction so that the patient would realize that this is a important medication um, that he needs to take for the heart failure. Um, the pharmacist also reviewed the, the patient's um, medication um, record and really compared this to um, the guidelines uh, for heart failure and looked for any possible um, areas where um, patients, their medication treatment could be optimized, where, where possibly other medications uh, would be appropriate to add medications or certain doses where those would be appropriate to increase the doses of certain medications. Um, so at the VA, um, our clinical pharmacists do have, um, can, can receive prescriptive authority in that they um, can go through the privileging credentialing process and able to uh, prescribe medications through protocol. In this case, however, this um, 
for, for this pilot, the pharmacist did not have prescriptive authority and basically reviewed any recommendations on medications with the heart failure provider. And um, basically the heart failure provider then made uh, changes as appropriate. So next slide, please. So the heart failure provider really had uh, responsibility for the overall care of the patient. Um, they uh, reviewed um, the information that was collected. Um, they collaborated with the team. They evaluated the patient if they were ready for uh, gu guideline directed medication therapy optimization. They contacted the patient as needed and um, communicated any recommended changes. And they um, made um, proper, appropriate documentation into the medical record as appropriate. Okay. Um, next slide, please. So um, looking at the results, so this team identified 58 high-risk heart failure patients and asked them to participate in this um, performance improvement project. Um, 41 eventually enrolled um, uh, with telehealth. And because of you know, life stressors, actually three did not even uh, hook up the machines that did not even transmit uh, one time, but 38 patients transmitted for more than a week and um, 38 of uh, 30 are still active patients. So we did have a fallout of, of a little over 25% of those that are enrolled uh, fell out. And uh, next slide, please. So this was a performance improvement project. Um, there were some process measures that were looked at. One process measure that was looked at were the weekly phone calls that were made by the um, home telehealth nurse. And they uh, set a target level at 20%. Um, the missed calls being less than 20%. And the initial evaluation showed that there was actually a higher than, than, um, than that, um, that the resulted that you know, nurses were um, missing, uh, not, not being able to communicate with the patients uh, on a weekly basis. Um, a lot of times they were unable to just reach the patients. Um, so some interventions were made. Uh, basically, the uh, nurses were trying to uh, call the patients uh, more frequently to making sure that they could, can reach them. They were able to reach them on a weekly basis. And after 15 weeks, um, this um, intervention was made. And later on, uh, actually, um, the, the missed rate was about 15%, so below the target. Um, the other area that they looked at were when there were changes in symptoms or signs that were reported by the home telehealth nurses, nurses um, they looked at whether there was any documentation um, by the cardiology provider when, when this information was um, forwarded to them. Um, it turned out the, you know, the target level was set at 10% and the initial evaluation um, it was slightly more than that, but at 15 weeks, um, there was an intervention done, basically reaching out to all the cardiology providers that were part of this. And um, later on, there was basically zero um, missed uh, intervention documentation. Um, regarding what the, the intervention was, it wasn't always a case where the, the medications were changed or anything like that. Um, sometimes it was an issue of maybe the patient wasn't compliant at that time and that's why the, the, the numbers were being you know, changed or the biometrics were changing. Um, and um, so sometimes uh, basically the, there was an issue of in, in, you know, making sure the patients were compliant with their medications or with diet. Um, but you know, making sure that documentation was part of the record um, uh, was pretty good at, at the end of this. Uh, next slide, please. So um, looking at the medication therapy, um, uh, looking at what happened uh, in this performance improvement project. Uh, during this time, there, was, there were 41 diuretic changes by the heart failure provider. Um, some of this was up titration, but some of this was down titration also. Um, patients were also analyzed on uh, really two metrics on their medication therapy. One was based upon the number of heart failure medications that were prescribed versus the number that they were eligible for according to the guideline-based medication therapy. And the second metric was based upon the dosing of these heart failure medications, whether that dosing was optimized. So looking at after 20 weeks of therapy, um, 20 weeks of being on the telehealth program, um, there was a 20% increase in patients receiving 
all of the recommended guideline directed heart failure medications. And there was a 24% increase in the optimized dosing of heart failure medications. Next slide, please. So this was the main result. So looking at the ER visits and hospitalizations, basically there was a 75% decrease in ER visits and hospitalizations of the group that participated in this uh, telehealth program. Um, so basically we saw one fourth of the e emergency room visits and hospitalizations in this group um, with these, with the telehealth program and with the team taking care of these patients. Um, they also analyzed what the cost of running this program was versus the cost savings. Um, they projected the cost savings you know, of this program, just of these 34 patients, was 640000 per year. Um, the personnel cost of running this program was about over 100000 uh, for five months. Um, and the savings for hospitalization alone was, was 380000 uh, for this group of patients. So um, next slide, please. So looking at some of the examples of uh, patients uh, where there was intervention done by the team. So um, this first patient, the patient was discharged from an outside hospital. And at the outside hospital, he was given IV fluids, was somewhat fluid overloaded. Um, this was noted by the team. The team was able to increase the diuretic. It uh, was able to decrease some of their other, his other medications and the patient simply did uh, very well. Um, in the second case, a uh, patient with known fragile fluid status, a history of multiple hospital, hospital admissions, um, continued to have shortness of breath, edema af after being discharged from the hospital. And it was found out that this patient was actually given the wrong dose of uh, diuretic or wrong dose of medication by the assisted living facility that, that he was in. And so the medication dose was adjusted and the patient uh, improved with that. And on the bottom patient, this patient really had a low blood pressure um, after starting hippoglyphosin. Um, this was actually started for diabetes or cardiology. The, the cardiology provider was able to adjust uh, the other uh, medications and uh, increase the fluid status and the patient's uh, symptoms resolved. Um, and in many of these cases, many cases would have uh, probably ended up in the emergency room and possibly in the hospital um, if um, they weren't part of this um, telehealth monitoring team. Next slide, please. So overall, the team was actually quite uh, quite happy with the work um, uh, that they were doing and seeing the, the results that they were seeing. Um, one of the quotes with the patient was that being part of this program has been great. I rely on my nurse to give me advice and to remind me to take my medications. Uh, because of her, I have not been admitted since last year. Um, statement from the telehealth nurse, this has really helped us excel as nurses and be more confident in ourselves. I think the veterans are getting to trust us and be more honest with us. And from the cardiology nurse practitioner, this is helping me a lot. I'm now spacing out my patient appointments. I'm more comfortable with doing phone appointments because I have vitals and a, a template and I can trust the information is reliable. Next slide, please. So this performance improvement project is actually undergoing um, institutional review board right now to be expanded into a, a study. So um, what's going on next is that this project will be expanded. And there actually is another project, um, similar project that's happening along with this. Uh, right now it's a performance improvement project. And what they're looking at is they're looking at class three uh, class four heart failure patients that were seen in the emergency room and discharged home. So the majority of patients that, uh, heart failure patients that are seen in the emergency room, the majority are um, uh, being admitted to the hospital, but there are some that are being discharged. And um, right now, this group of patients who are being discharged at home, um, they are being invited to join up with this uh, telehealth team, um, the same team that, we, that I had talked about. So the class three, class four, maybe say these are the patients who are somewhat sicker, uh, that may be comfortable at rest, but really have a limitation of uh, physical activity with uh, just mild uh, physical activity, um, or those patients who, are, who have symptoms at rest. 
So next slide, please. So the world of telehealth, uh, I think this is really an exciting time to be in, um, in, in telehealth. Um, really there, it's rapidly evolving. There are really many advances and becoming more widespread in its use. Um, the advances in technology have been really incredible um, for monitoring devices. Um, they've shifted from the hospital to the clinic and now into the patient's home and now also to you know, wearables and implantables. Um, this may be science fiction right now, but maybe in the near future, we'll have sensors in a patient's uh, socks. So a patient, a heart failure patient who puts on their socks will get information regarding their, their vital signs, temperature, heart rate, pulse, um, uh, blood pressure, uh, maybe a pulse oximeter, uh, maybe their, uh, their, also their weight, uh, their activity level, possibly even their fluid status. So maybe that might be uh, something that's possible in the near future. Um, so telehealth um, does allow itself for remote monitoring, but also uh, medication management, uh, patient education. Um, it does lend itself very well to that. And one other thing to say is that many of these patients do have other comorbidities. So we're able to you know, really help manage these patients with their comorbidities with this monitoring system that they have at home. So um, that's the end of my presentation. I right, uh, thank you very much and uh, we'll welcome uh, any questions. Well, thank you very much for uh, a very comprehensive look at the, at the VA program. And uh, <clears throat> I was certainly impressed with the fact that, um, you know, we have toyed around with heart failure patients, how to reduce hospitalizations and deaths. In fact, uh, I'm sure you're aware that CMS gave us incentives to reduce hospitalizations in hospital patients uh, on discharge that was very successful in reducing hospitalizations, but inadvertently increased the mortality rate in that. And that program came under fire because it accomplished one thing, but actually led to higher mortality in that group. So it wasn't there. So I was impressed with the fact that you were able to lower both mortality and hospitalization in some of these uh, telehealth uh, studies. I also noticed that it's important in your approach to have uh, both the coordinator, the RN, as well as the pharmacist and I looked at your cost of about 113,000 per in for the trial, um, which comes out to a little over 3,000 per patient. And I'm looking at the state of California for our master plan. If we want to approach improving heart failure treatment in California, we have about 600,000 individuals in in California with heart failure. And I looked at your numbers and back at the envelope, looks like it would be one to two billion dollars to provide the type of services that you did in your study or trial uh, for that. And, uh, and I think that we have to consider that as an initial cost. Ultimately, we would potentially save money for our hospitalizations if the state of California is in fact paying for that. So uh, I was very impressed uh, with that and uh, I look forward to uh, other questions, but I think that that was a, an elegant presentation that may have a very a good future for let's say when we deal with a master plan for the state of California. Yeah, one thing I wanted to mention regarding the cost. Um, so one thing that was really um, uh, not figured out is, is what was the appropriate panel size for our heart failure patients with our staff. Um, so with our telehealth staff especially, we actually gave them a very, very a small panel size um, with this program. <coughs> Excuse me. So that um, may change in the future as to what their panel size would be as they get, we get more experience as to what they can handle. Yeah, so uh, I guess that would be a good question is how many uh, patients can a nurse handle and a pharmacist handle, because that would directly affect the FTEs and the positions that we had. 
for it. But very impressive uh, data. Uh, yeah. Andrew, Andrew's on board as well, and I don't want to lose him. Uh, Andrew, uh, thanks for your excellent uh, presentation. Um, I noticed in your preserved ejection fraction uh, group uh, that the uh, <clears throat> subgroup uh, of males was perhaps not as benefited from ARNI. Uh, does that mean that is that that's probably a uh, <clears throat> a post-study uh, uh, you know, grouping uh, and perhaps not pre-specified, does that mean that you would primarily direct ARNI in your preserved ejection fraction at females or uh, do you wanna wait for more data to decide if males could get a benefit from that? Yeah, you're absolutely right that that was not a pre-specified analysis. Um, that was post hoc and you know, really there were three subgroups for which um, there was found to be a more robust benefit in Paragon HF. So women, uh, patients with, a, with an EF that is preserved but not normal, so the 50 to 60% group, and then patients with a recent hospitalization. And, you know, with, with two out of the three, you can sort of come up with some sort of biological plausible mechanism to explain it. The finding with women is kind of unclear. So I am um, I generally don't let that affect my practice. Um, I consider, you know, men and women the same. And, you know, in deciding who's going to drive a, mo a more robust benefit, the, the critical factors for me are, one, what is their EF? And two, have they recently been hospitalized? We know from HEPPEF patients that their natural mm -hmm. history is quite different once they've been hospitalized. And, and actually, you know, that's really the time that they come to my attention. Like if they're a stable ambulatory patient that has a little bit of shortness of breath with exertion, I'm unlikely to have ever met them. So, you know, once they've been hospitalized, that's a change in their natural history and their prognosis. And that's when they're on my radar. And I, I typically consider those patients for Arnie's and for SGL2s. Thank you. Uh, well, let's open it up for other questions. Uh, I uh, see on the, let's see, on the Q&A, are there uh, no open questions right now? So you've answered those. So on the panel that we have open, uh, are there anyone, any questions that uh, you would like to address to our speakers? Well, I have to say, I was very, very impressed by Dr. So's more than $14,000 per patient savings. So you obviously got something really right with the panel size, uh, Dr. So, and I'd, I'd love your thoughts on, on scaling this up? Yeah, so, um, you know, a couple of things that I, I think that the, um, there still needs to be work on. Um, so the panel sizes, um, I, I think we did purposely give um, our, our staff small panel sizes because this was a new program and to make sure that, you know, they were um, had enough time to, to learn and to do what they needed to do. Um, so, uh, so panel sizes, that needs to be figured out. Um, basically the panel size for this performance approval project was maybe about um, one third of what the normal panel size would be for those nurses. So um, even with that, the, the cost came out to be, you know, quite a bit of savings of um, looking at the, the cost of hospitalization. The other thing that I still need to work is to find out, to, to think about when patients could be discharged from a telehealth program. You know, patients who are considered to be stable. You know, at, at what what's the end point um, if patients are stable and, and doing okay? You know, to discharge them back to regular care. Um, so that would you know be additional savings by being able to you know discharge the patients who are more stable. Um, so we have a couple of questions that are in chat, and this would be for Andrew, and actually it's from a physician who was at Kaiser, uh, Dr. Namana, who wanted to know uh, the current practice in, in treating patients at, uh, at Kaiser or at KP. Um, do you think you're close to this level of optimization of uh, reduced ejection fraction uh, in your patients at Kaiser or is there room to grow even at Kaiser? 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think that um, I think there's room to grow for for everybody. Like if you look at some of the some of the national registries, like you sh shared some data um, from Champ. You know, when you look at the four pillars of heart failure, only one percent of patients are on all four medications at the right dose. So ninety nine percent of the patients have some area for improvement. I will say that the the gaps between um, uh, between the guidelines and reality are definitely smaller at KP. And yeah, I think we've done a really good job to stay, uh, to stay ahead of the curve. You know, we currently, our internal guidelines do recommend quadruple therapy for HEFREF. And we, um, we are very easily able to get uh, patients um, on beta blockers, ARNIs, spironolactone and SGL2 inhibitors at a, at a reasonable cost. Um, so yeah, I think we're doing a great job, but there's always room for improvement. Uh, so I see Joe Sky on this. Joe, in the military, do you have patients with heart failure that need to uh, be treated with these uh, therapies? Yeah, we do. And I, I guess I have the same question that I think a lot of other people have is just how much of a penetrance is there in use? And uh, is it usually done uh, by the cardiologist or a combination of involving, uh, in some cases, our endocrinologist. I think more and more it's falling on cardiology, and I'd be curious to hear what our what our uh, presenter has to say. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, you know, as I, as I mentioned, kind of given the history of the of SGL twos, I think is what you're referring to. You know, that um, really was developed as a diabetes drug, and initially it was within the domain of endocrinology, but you know, it's third, fourth line for diabetes, and now it's first line for heart failure. So I think that we need to, we would do um, the best if we just forgot that that medication has anything to do with yeah. diabetes and approached it, approached it just like the other yeah. ones. And so endocrinologists aren't prescribing it, primary care doctors aren't prescribing it a lot. That's within, that's within the wheelhouse of, uh, of, of general cardiologists. What do, what do you think the, what do you think the usage is compared to what the usage should be? Do you, have, do you have any data on that? Yes, yeah, so that's it, that's such a new class of medications. I mean, Emperor Preserved, you know, was just presented a few months ago that, I mean, the pen, the penetrance is low right now. I mean, you know, you yeah. know well that it takes five to 10 years to sort of go from clinical trials to guidelines to real world practice. So I think in, in events like this are important to, to accelerating that timeline. Um, and my hope is that it'll get better. But yeah, that's that we probably just scratched the surface there. Yeah, at our institution, our, our heart failure clinic uh, has been has been the best about using it. And then for the rest of us, I think we're the rest of us who in our own clinics, I think it's it we're definitely I'm faced with the challenges to remember to add in another class that I'm not used to thinking about. Yeah, it's hard. I would say that um, a great time is during hospitalization. So quite a few people have written editorials yeah. and reviews on what they're terming, you know, rapid sequence initiation. And they've shown that, you know, within two or three days, you know, within the time frame of a hospitalization for worsening heart failure, that you can get people on low doses of all four medications. So that's really, that's really, yeah, that's a sentinel event in, in a HEFREF and a HEFPEF patient's natural history. And that's an ideal time to review their background therapy and to make some adjustments. Thank you. It was like a great combining, presentation. Combining uh, what the two of you have talked about, Dr. So and Dr. Ambrosi, I wonder if there couldn't be a proactive quality improvement project undertaken specifically for those with preserved ejection fraction heart failure to do something like this combined outreach telehealth program specifically for, you know, looking in the, in the, um, electronic health records for these patients that have not had a lot of care options in the past to get them on to this therapy before, long before they need hospitalization. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that, that you make an, an excellent point. You know, there's some data from clinical trials, particularly the ones done with, um, with Arnie's that you know, that the first event a patient experience may be a fatal endpoint, maybe, maybe a death. So, you know, if you don't start these, if you don't proactively start these medications, you may miss your window of opportunity. Yeah, Andrew, I thought it was uh, impressive that you showed that early treatment is better. Um, for heart failure, for a long time, we used to wait 
until the patient was stable meant they were discharged from the hospital, stable on their medicines, and then we would gradually titrate up their doses. But I think the evidence shows that that was probably wrong, that starting early is better, especially your trial. It showed that if you did not start it in the hospital, but waited until afterwards, you did not regain that lost function for those individuals. So you have to start early, otherwise you're gonna lose things that do not come back in that population. So it's very important to do it. And it often means that we have to be a little bit more aggressive than we're used to. Mm -hmm. And if a patient is maybe slightly lightheaded, that doesn't mean you stop therapy at that point in time. You have to balance that uh, lightheadedness versus actually symptomatic hypotension, which is more severe. And patients actually get used to that little lightheaded feeling when they first stand up. And sometimes some um, just lifestyle modifications of, you know, let your feet hang down before you sit up, stand up slowly, especially in the morning, can be helpful to get them onto therapy when you explain to them how much this is helping their overall outcome. Yeah, I think you're, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, not only is it safe for early in-hospital initiation, it may be safer. Um, a lot of these new medications have a diuretic component and starting, starting them in a patient that's decompensated um, may be better and help you determine what their true diuretic requirements are. So I often, I like to start Arnie's and SGL2s when they're in the hospital and they're a little wet. I find that that's the, uh, that, that's the, ideal, the ideal time. <laughs> one, of the question, one of the questions we had in concerns are these often are newer medicines and the newer medicines for many uh, hospital systems is uh, higher cost. And so these are individuals who now have problems with the uh, cost. Um, is that something you think that drives the poor compliance or the, uh, the inertia that we have is that patients push back because, hey, I'm taking all these medicines. Why are you telling me I now have to take another one? I'll replace it, but I don't want to necessarily add a medicine. And who's paying for that copay? I have to pay for it, not you. And so that is often resistance that we could see. Uh, do you think that plays a part in some of our inertia or poor compliance? I think it plays a part. I think it plays a smaller part than we think, though. Like we like to think that that's what it is. It's that they're new, they're expensive, and there's concerns about copays. But just look at the other classes of medications that cost dollars now: beta blockers, traditional ACEs and ARBs, spironolactone. Uh, you know, we haven't we haven't achieved. You know, we have not achieved our targets for, for using some of those medications. They've been around for decades and are all generic. So I think that you're right that that does, cost does play a component, but I think the biggest component is, is clinical inertia. I mean, I think that slide I showed is quite compelling where the number of new starts and up titrates is roughly offset by the number of discontinuations and down titrations. It, we basically, over the course of 12 to 24 months in managing a heart failure patient, have no net change at a population level. Uh, any other questions for our panelists? I see that Steve Sidney is talking about um, a number of population-related dynamics that are likely to drive up the number of heart failure cases. Steve, do you want to come on video or, or audio and talk about what, uh, what you're referring to, Dr. Sidney? He is on mute, so he might not be able to join us. He's just chatted that. I'm not sure what yeah. he means. Uh, Steve is one of my colleagues at the at the Division of Research, and I think he's uh, I think he's commenting that um, you know the population of heart failure patients, particularly HEPPEF, is is growing quite a quite a bit. So it's going to be it's not just a big problem; it's a growing problem at at sort of um, a um, an exponential rate. 
And, and why is that, Dr. Ambrosi? Uh, aging of the population. Uh, people are people are living longer. Um, you know, they're they're they have more more medical problems. And, um, all roads all roads end in heart failure. So it's just it's just growing as a result of demographic changes. Yeah, you can't say that. You have to give us a prevention idea here. Is it that all roads lead to heart failure if you don't exercise X amount? Per week, or please give us a ray of hope here. Us, there is there is um, a role for prevention. So we really started in heart failure by treating the sickest of patients, and gradually our medications have have gone all the way from the highly symptomatic to the minimally symptomatic. And yes, there's a lot of interest now in heart failure prevention. So some of the same same medications that are being <laughs> studied as treatments for heart failure, like uh, RNAs and SGL2 inhibitors, are also being studied. Um, and in patients without heart failure as preventative measures. So there is some encouragement and some of the lifestyle changes that you mentioned as well, like better control of, of risk factors and exercise, um, you know, reduces one's long-term risk. Can you talk about uh, the role of exercise with active heart failure patients and the importance of moving that blood with, yeah, it's with safe. your leg? It's, it's absolutely safe. Um, you know, there's this misconception by patients that if you have if you have heart disease, if you have heart failure or some other heart condition that exercise is not safe the number of conditions for which you know it's unsafe to exercise is very small you know some uh, so, um, patients that have unstable ischemic symptoms or certain stenotic valvular lesions or pulmonary hypertension very small number of conditions but for your bread and butter heart failure patient exercise is safe and, and encouraged and and that's based on a landmark NIH study, HF Action, where they studied patients and showed that it, it did not um, increase their risk of, of death or hospitalization. And in fact, it improved their functional status and their quality of life. So there's, um, there are some, some real reasons to encourage exercise. And that's true for HEFREF and HEFF. So what would be the mechanism of improving quality of life and reducing symptoms uh, by exercise? What would be that um, essential dose? It's probably a lot of things, probably some cardiac factors, but probably some extra cardiac factors. Heart failure is associated with uh, cachexia and weight loss and loss of muscle mass and, you know, recovering some of those, recovering some of your peripheral musculature probably improves your, your symptoms, your quality of life. Yeah, and I think uh, exercise also reduces your heart rate. And we do know that heart rate reduction and heart failure is protective uh, for those individuals. And related to Hattie, your earlier question, how do we avoid all of this? Well, we listed earlier, just briefly, but <clears throat> what were the um, risk factors for both preserved ejection fraction heart failure and, and what were the risk factors for reduced ejection fraction. And we talked about coronary disease as being a big factor for reduced ejection fraction and smoking in men. And so clearly prevention there is what right care is trying to do is to prevent coronary artery disease, recognize it early before you have the heart attack and reduced ejection fraction. And certainly for preserved ejection fraction, which is now taking over our heart failure clinics, hypertension, big, big reason uh, that can be started very early to, to prevent uh, diabetes, reduce that at that point in time, cholesterol, dyslipidemia in those individuals and improving diet and exercise in that population. So those are the big factors for preserved ejection fraction, all of which are preventable with a lifestyle. And if lifestyle is not enough, we have treatments for those, including today we have treatments for blood, blood, blood pressure, cholesterol, and, uh, and uh, also for actually diet, for diabetes and for obesity, which is a contributing factor for preserved ejection fraction. So we now have FDA approval for some of those new obesity things. And we're going to actually devote in the next year, one of our right care programs to the treatment and new treatments for uh, obesity along those lines. 
That program will be on Monday, January 10th. And I just want to announce before we wrap up, because we're almost at 2.30, that on Tuesday, November 30th, we're going to have a very special program on stroke, uh, which I would like to invite you all to join us for. Uh, so we're going to be hearing from the head of stroke uh, at Stanford University, Greg Albers, and also Nirali Vora at Stanford. And um, we'll hear about AFib and stroke from a world-renowned expert at Cedar sinai That meeting will be from 4 to 6 p.m. And it's a very optimistic moment in the world of stroke where we're expanding the treatment window quite significantly, both with uh, medications and with uh, thrombectomy therapy. So it's a nice uh, breakthrough moment in both uh, heart failure and stroke. And so it's wonderful to wrap up our year of uh, programming at the end of November uh, with two really positive um, developments in heart failure and in stroke. So Dr. So, Dr. Ambrosi, amazing material that you've covered. I hope you'll get to know each other and collaborate around the idea that occurs to me that with the new um, breakthrough on empagliflozin, if you take that QI project that Earl So described where he was saving $14,500 net per patient on this proactive telemedicine program for high-risk heart failure patients, if you did that for your empagliflozin patients, you, it seems like you would be much less likely to develop those infections of concern as you titrate up the medication. So very hopeful material here and uh, we're Excited that we've been able to introduce people across uh, UC Davis in Sacramento, uh, Los Angeles, Veterans Administration, and Kaiser Oakland in San Francisco, as well as Watts Healthcare in uh, Los Angeles. Uh, we even have San Diego with us. Uh, Scott Flynn is with us. So we have, um, thank you, Dr. Brooks, for being with us today. Did you have a final question? Do you want to? No, no, excellent presentation. Please continue. Well, between now and our next program, I would like to wish you a very happy and safe Thanksgiving. I think Dr. Bomber gave us um, a bit of a um, glass of cold water as we head into the Thanksgiving holidays that we needn't let our guard down uh, with the rising uh, breakthrough infections occurring and the um, increasing inside gatherings and our desire to gather with family. So I would just encourage everyone to try to be outside, keep the windows open, keep masking. I am just so glad and so grateful for all of your devotion to uh, best practices. So thank you very much and join us again on Tuesday, November 30th.